All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the panel. Uh, hopefully you are here for the panel and not for how to structure complex sites, because if you're looking for how to structure complex sites, that's in the other room. You can leave now. We want to see you. Okay, fantastic. They're probably over there wishing they were here, so uh, expect more people to join. Uh, we got one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is the uh, business and growth panel. Uh, so we have a, uh, a, a group of uh, guys who I, I've known all of you for a number of years and really respect uh, what you've been able to accomplish uh, in your, uh, your businesses and also really respect you all as, as human beings. So I'm really glad that uh, you guys were able to be here today. Um, Alonzo is the CEO of Eleven Online, a digital agency in uh, New Mexico. Uh, Alonzo uh, had been working in uh, nonprofits and um, decided to go back and, and try a different career. Went to a coding boot camp. Um, was what a six-week program, something like that. It was a nine-week program at the time. Nine-week program, uh, and came out, started an agency, and uh, within a year and a half, two years, had eleven employees, um, and uh, really, you know, has grown grown really quickly and done a lot of high-quality work. Um, it's been impressive to watch. Uh, Corey, you know from earlier today. Um, built iThemes up from scratch uh, to be one of the, the premier companies in the WordPress space um, and just sold it earlier this year. Um, and uh, Jesse worked with me at Brute Protect um, and uh, helped, was, you were what, a customer champion? What was your? Director of Innovation. Director of Innovation, <laughs> such a good title. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, now, did, did an amazing job of, of helping us um, determine a product and a, a focus and grow, and uh, it's really a, a key member of the team. Um, it's always good to work with you. So, Jesse's now at, at Automatic and uh, works on growth and partnerships uh, for Jetpack. So, these guys know what they're talking about. Uh, I wanted to kick things off with a question, and then uh, we'll just sort of let some questions come in. and. and go where it goes, but uh, I'm wondering for you guys uh, what a typical day looks like. How do you structure your time uh, to be most effective? Okay, I can start. Um, <laughs> yeah, because uh, I think that's something that uh, is a con constantly iterating and it's a constant struggle and constant battle. Um, so. I do, uh, I'm basically doing most of the sales processes at this stage with our company and most of the strategic initiatives, growth and development and stuff like that. So um, typically peppered throughout my day are calls uh, with potential clients, calls with existing clients. Um, and then uh, what's really, really important for me is I block off time in my calendar. Um, for let's say it could be anything from working on a response to an RFP, it could be um, it could be writing, um, it could be community engagement of some kind or a networking piece of some of some sort. Um, that is actually the most critical component, and, and I I have to probably be more aggressive about blocking off those times because what happens is my calendar, you know. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Calendly or a service like that. I, I send that out to people, um, like they want to set up a meeting or whatever. I send that out to people, and then before I know it, like I look at my next week, and it's like I got no time. <laughs> so I, you know, I have to be more kind of planful and aggressive about that. But so it typically looks like I, I try and try and get going after I drop the kids off. And so around nine, um, I try and quit around five five thirty. Um, I try not to work at night after the kids go to bed. Have you gotten better at that? I know you used to have a real problem. I did, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just it's the house is so quiet, and you know, um, so but but yeah, I mean that that just that has consequences if you keep doing that. So yeah, roughly that's what it looks like for me. 
So broadly, I would say for me, um, I think an effect of what took us a long time to try to empower our team to make decisions based on values and stories frees me up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And then I probably end up, um, you know, meetings which are trying to facilitate conversations. I try to stay out of meetings as much as I can because I realized pretty early on that when I was in meetings, I caused problems. And... <laughs> I don't like them anyway. So, uh, and then uh, I think you know the occasional fire or conversation that needs to have, but mostly it's around Slack. And um, I'm I'm still kind of an introvert, so I I like you know my office is in the corner of our office in Oklahoma City, where um, I get to be the hermit yeah. sometimes. I'll just add two little things. I use Calendly all the time. It's a great tool. You can send out a link and people can schedule time with you. Uh, I, I used to allow that to kind of go uh, on without uh, kind of any filter or anything like that. But now uh, what I've really found is that uh, meetings tend to either delay the process because you're trying to find time to sync when you could be having these conversations in Slack or email. Um, so uh, try not to have a meeting unless it's actually important or going to drive the conversation forward. Uh, and then the other thing I would add is that um, when you talked about blocking out part of your calendar, something I've been trying lately is that I scheduled a whole bunch of things that I want to do every day uh, at around the 4 a.m. block. And then the night before or early in the morning, I'll just shift those around my schedule um, down each okay. day. So whether it's taking a class or writing up uh, some notes from something or going to the gym, um, I have a bunch of these little blocks at the top of my calendar. I kind of slide them around so that I know I can fit them in during the day. And it's also a reminder not to forget to do it. That's cool. Um, yeah. That's Smart. a good idea. You don't do them at 4. Well, Calendly right now is set from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. for okay. me. So I'll take calls as early as 6 a.m. Not 4. But that's only for Europe. you know our European and Asian oh, okay. partners. Right. <laughs> to make right, it a little bit easier enough. on them. Yeah. But I'm an early bird. Yeah. 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 For sure. That's a great idea. Putting those at 4 a.m. and then fishing yeah. them into your calendar. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like it. Mr. Galansky. So I'm really curious. Um, how do you all find time uh, in your routines that you've generated over the years to kind of experiment with new ways of doing things, whether it be innovating on product, whether it be innovating your business? When do you fit that in? How do you work that into your routine and working with your current ways? I have a four-day work week on everything else. Monday through Friday is most of my business stuff, and uh, Monday through Thursday is most of my business stuff, my partnership meetings, my all the other stuff. And Fridays I've literally dedicated towards the stuff that we're working on now, uh, around innovating on marketing and things like that. Um, that whole day is blocked off. I take no meetings, no nothing like that. Yeah, so for, for me, uh, uh, you know, we have weekly partner meetings, um, and a chunk of that is reserved for exactly what you're talking about. Uh, looking at new workflows or updated workflows, or looking at tools that can make us be a little more efficient, things like that. It's, if you're not doing that, um, you're dying. And I think part of it is also, you know, there's, I've definitely seen the, the you know, the desire to sort of, tool your way out of everything um, and like have the flashy new tool and stuff like that. Um, so I think it, it helps when you have multiple people sort of brain power, be able, uh, be able to kind of think on it, think about how it could improve or affect our processes. And then we have action items that come out of those, right? Um, hey, we'll discuss it. It looks promising. You know, here's your action item for the next partner meeting. Test it out. Play around with it. And see where see where I think we think it could fit. You think it could fit, and then and report back. Um, so, it's just it's. I think it's just it's part of our culture from the standpoint of we're in New Mexico, and every little edge um, helps. Is it's a small market, and you know it's it's not. You know we're very lucky. We have some great out of state clients, but um, it's it's a tough market. So every little bit counts, really. How did each of you get your clients? What was your tactic? What was your method? To get 
first clients or yeah. customers? Yeah, clients, customers. Um, something that worked. What some, did it work? Uh, the thing that worked is, I think, conti continually putting educational, helpful content out. Um, so we started at themes, and I had this set of tutorials that I had built, and I was trying to sell them, and they weren't really selling. And I had a copywriter friend go, why don't you just put those for free? So that was our tutorial section, which became some of our longest, um, well-ranked, well-trafficked content that became a huge lead for us. So the power of WordPress and everything we do is being able to put SEO, long-tail type content online, I think is a strategy over and over and over and over and over. Almost any, any business being able to. So that's how we drive a lot of our lead generation, I guess, to date. And then you use email to capture and market to this. One thing that um, Matt Mullenweg uh, at Automatic, uh, our CEO, told me, uh, which really resonated with me, was that um, good partners motivate small par uh, slow partners. Um, so this idea was, uh, so the work that I do is not on a typical client uh, basis, right? We're not building websites for large uh, companies or something like that. What we're... The work that I'm doing is more around partnering with hosting companies and things like that to distribute Jetpack. And this program that exists today that you can see in InMotion, DreamHost, um, and a variety of other companies uh, didn't exist just 18 months ago. Um, <clears throat> so what we ended up doing was just really kind of like getting introductions, cold calling, fi identifying partners that would be great partners and just working really hard to get them and then being very transparent about our partnership with those companies and that drove a great deal of traffic uh, for us to, to build an entire business or a partnership program around that. Uh, and I think that would translate the same way for clients. If you get, if you land a very large client and you can be very transparent about it and, and innovate and do something really cool with them, um, that'll drive uh, excitement around your brand and, and the things that you're building. So writing case studies and postmortems. Yeah, even just a simple partners page or, or a client list page is enough sometimes. You know. Uh, can I ask? Are you a freelancer? Or? No. So I'm a dietitian. I blog health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, so just working on trying to get my blog out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so this kind of brings me back, right? Like when we first started, like coming out of the boot camp. Um, I didn't know anything. Like, nothing. I mean, I knew how to build some sites. I started learning about WordPress. I, you know, I knew some fundamentals. But as far as, like, business, like, nothing. I didn't come from, like, a family of entrepreneurs or any of that stuff. Um, uh, I, I went a lot with just instincts, right? And so one of my instincts was um, we just got to do work. And so I went to friends and family. <laughs> that's, that's where we started. And then... Uh, started kind of entertaining like, trades. One, one of the first WordPress sites we built was for like a rummage, furniture rummage store in, in, in Albuquerque. And we did it for old furniture. So I still have some of that stuff in my house. It's pretty cool. But um, just, just to start building our workflows and our processes and um, you know, the first real contract I got was from uh, a friend from high school, and then um, I started going to, um, you know, just different networking events. And what I can tell you, you, you ask what what didn't work, what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, don't be the card dealer at like some of these, you know, network things. It, um, it's that the networking stuff and, and getting to know people in the community if you're doing local work it's a long play it's a long term investment you're building relationships passing out cards does not build relationships it just makes you look like shill and crass and <laughs> as far as I'm concerned and so like if you're just if you're engaging people and letting people know what you do and, and building real relationships um, a lot of the relations I built then they didn't pay off right there and then but eventually they manifested themselves into referrals or, you know, so, so it, I don't know, I, I, I think fondly on that time because I really didn't know what the hell I was doing and I was just, <laughs> just kind of making it up. So how long have you been a dietitian or have? Um, I've been a dietitian for about two years and I just started entering this online space and I have okay. no idea what I'm doing 
Let me let me help connect what I said earlier to your particular case, if I could. I would. So you two years you've been working with clients, mm -hmm. and they probably have a set of common questions they ask every yeah. single time, right? Yeah. That's the stuff you put on your website. Okay. Now. SEO is a whole other thing, but what I'm saying is uh, how I would use this specifically for your context is all those common questions people ask, that's gold. Because, see, you know, you're the expert. I don't even know how to start working with you. So, but there's probably common questions that you can turn in, put into either an FAQ, an ebook, whatever. And then I would say open source your expertise. And here's what I mean by that is you, you have keys, essentials, things that you probably do that are like in that you know, diet, dietitian one-on-one kind of category, mm -hmm. and I would put that all online. And here's why, and, and maybe consider to your personality is video, audio, stuff like that, because another thing is, so you're thinking of your customer and you're going, okay, when they hit my website, how do I lower all the barriers for them to work with me? So FAQs, right? I mean, what are those key critical questions that they can learn before even calling you? And you're educating your customer. So here's the question. Who do you want your customers to become? Put all that on your site. It's free, 24-7. Lower all the barriers. What's the biggest barrier um, that you, your clients have to work with you? And demolish it with content on your site. And then maybe use vehicles like, you know, if you like doing video, a video series, like here's my tips of the week for X. And then the other phrase I would look and you know just Google is local SEO. So I don't know how your business is shaped, but so for instance, if you're in Portland here, somebody's hitting dietitian into Google, but you're the Portland Google knows they're in Portland kind of thing. That I, I'm not an SEO expert. I'm just saying that's something to probably dive into. Yeah. But do, Absolutely. Yeah, the personalization side of that is really important. So if you're if you're servicing a local community, you should define that in your site so that Google can understand that, and then it gives you a niche too. If you're the only one, if you're one of three dietitians in the area, it's a lot easier for you to compete against ten thousand across the country. It's like in the old days, everybody would be in the phone book, but you can have an edge with that. Like if your business is is local, like face to face here, then local SEO is. Portland dietitian, you know, kind of stuff. I would add one more thing onto that, and, and that's just that uh, it can become really easy to uh, feel like I can't I can't give this information away for free because this is what I want people to pay me for. But that's not what people people are paying me for, right? If if you can if you can establish use that to establish yourself as an expert and give them that starter, they're still going to want to engage you so that they can come up with a plan that works specifically for them. But, uh, yeah, by putting that information out there, uh, yeah, you're going to see traffic and you're going you're gonna to establish yourself as an expert. Super true. Very true. And get the edge. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, in your previous talk, um, you talked about your team having this great synergy, right? And so I was wondering if any of you would have um, tips on hiring and the favorite interview questions and, you know. So hiring is the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Tips uh, on hiring. Yeah. Um, Automatic has a really unique hiring process by which we uh, put out an ad uh, on our site. We actually get a decent amount of traffic to that, so that's easy to, to bring in resumes. We review the resume, then we go through an entire trial process. Um, so it's uh, comprised of several interviews and then it's an actual uh, paid work for hire kind of scenario by you could work for a couple weeks or a couple months um, on a specific project and the goal of that is really to understand not necessarily your skill level but to understand your communication abilities and, and how you blend with the teams and, and work well with company, uh, you know the rest of us. As far as a favorite question um, I usually like to just kind of create open-ended questions that help people talk about themselves mm -hmm. uh, because, I, I mean, I can ask very simple questions, but if I get one-word answers, it's, uh, we'll be at it all day, right? right? So I want to hear what it is that you're passionate about and, and what it is that makes you think that you're different than the 10 other candidates for the, the position. So I, over 10 years, we've you know, interviewed, I don't know how many people, right? And um, I'll say that I, it's not a magical formula for me um, at all. It's, it's part art, 
there's some science to it, but there's so many, you know, job interview things out there that anybody can fool you, you know, and we've been fooled. But I would say the biggest distinguishing in just my context of 20 people, not like 500 at Autumn, I don't even know what you guys are at. Close to 800. 800 uh, at Automac. I have not scaled to that, but I would say because of this thing, criteria I'm going to give you, um, so I don't know how it would operate at 800. But if I don't want them or wouldn't trust them to be in my home, they're not on my team. And if I don't enjoy them, like, I don't, we don't have to be best friends, but if we can't, like, and so work with other people on the team, they don't fit. So fit is first, mm -hmm. and then skill. You know, fit first. Do they, are they, you know, do I have enough of uh, information to see that they're going to, like, sink? Jesse and I are going to mm -hmm. sink. Alonzo and I are going to sink because it's oil and water sometimes, and that can be pretty bad. We've and we've got that before where we had to go. Nope, you're, you don't fit. You need to leave. You fit somewhere else. You know, you're not a bad person. So how do you do that then? How do you fire? Yeah, well. <laughs> so I, I, I am a people. I, I, I love people. I want to care about people, and empathy is a big value for me. But through pain of having people with me on the team for too long, mm -hmm. I care less about that. Like, if you don't, so I've gotten less and less and less where it's just like, sorry, you don't, you're, you don't belong here. You belong somewhere else. There's somewhere that probably fits you, but you don't belong here, and I've gotten easier about doing that. And so it's really simple conversations now. Where the first few times are really hard. First few times suck. <laughs> they all suck, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it's, but it they become shorter because it's like, I'm sorry, it's not working out. Mm -hmm. And they're, why? I'm sorry, it's not working out. I'd love to help you with that, but there's a lot of constraints where you got to be careful. Right. And so it's just, yeah. there's that Billy Bean movie, Moneyball, do you yeah. remember that? Where uh, Jonas, you know, <laughs> you know it was real quick. <laughs> sorry, you're good. He's like, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's not like that. It's not like that. But I've gotten less. You know, it's more about you don't you don't belong here. Do and you, it frees them up to go somewhere else too, by the way. Do you tend to do performance improvement plans before um, firing, or do you go straight to dismissal? Not formally, and you know we're only to twenty or so. But it's it's like you got a couple strikes, yeah. And if it's just not working out, I think it's typically I, I was at a meeting one time. And uh, we, we needed to, to let go of a person. And they had me, you know, they said, do you, who here has someone that you know you need to fire? And I was like, me. Left. And he was like, you know, sometimes people will stay longer than they need to and know it's bad. Mm -hmm. Drove to the office, said, sorry, it's not working out. The person goes, I was wondering how, why it took you two so long, yeah. you know. And that person got freed up to go find somewhere where she's supposed to be. So I think yeah. it's a double thing, pain and then free. Yeah, yeah they, uh, they usually know. Oh, yeah, they know. Yeah, uh, so, you know, just generally hiring, we, we really have had some good success and found some great people um, hiring non-traditional. We're all, the, all four partners are from non-traditional, you know, not necessarily uh, undergrad CS backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, so, a lot of the people we hired, we hired them as junior or entry level. We've hired some people out of the same boot camp we went to, um, and actually, it was interesting. Was I think one of the one of the ideas that I had that I think it really allowed us to scale. You know, I, I was thinking a lot about um, what 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 kind of makes us different in the context of the local ecosystem, and I thought, oh yeah, I went to this boot camp. Nobody around here knows what to do with people coming out of this boot camp. Um, but maybe we do, right? So, so that I think so we've had the attitude of giving, looking for inefficiencies in the market and like giving people shots. Um, and they they t they typically are very loyal and work really really hard. Um, so so there's that. As far as letting people go, uh, you know, first time I had to do it, it was really rough. It's really rough. And then I had to, you know, a couple, uh, three or four months ago, I had to let go of our fir the first person we hired. Um, and 
you know, had to do it. It, it just, it wasn't working out. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't working out and, and our business has kind of sh pivoted a little bit and, and, you know, the person wasn't able to help us the way we needed. Um, and it, I, you know, in my mind, I just built it up as like, just this painful, horrible thing. And then what I realized was, and it became true, like when, when she left, was uh, we leveled her up and someone else went and grabbed her and we're, we're both happier. And she, she's my friend. So, do you know, like, you know, like, I don't know, I'm proud of how that whole thing worked out. It's just sometimes it needs to happen. And I think, you know, if you have, if you do, do things in good faith uh, and people can sense that and realize that, understand that, I think it's a little bit easier. Oh, can I, can I pick you on that? Yeah. So, that just resonated with me too. So, here, when, when, when we have fired people, we have probably given people more uh, than, than maybe they should have, but with one defining characteristic, I can go to sleep at night. So I do the right thing, that's my right thing. Mm -hmm. And if I know I'm doing the right thing at night and can sleep at night, that's not always the case for the other person, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I know I've done the right thing, I'm good. Mm -hmm. like. And I, I think too that, that that hiring process is and needs to be a lot different when you are you know, a company of five, it looks different than when you're a company of 20, which looks way different yeah. from when you're a company of hundreds. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you're a small team, it's absolutely culture fit, number one, right? Culture fit. And for me, it was always culture fit and drive or capability, um, and then skill a distant third. Yeah. That, you know, Derek, uh, when, when I hired Derek, years ago, uh, he didn't have much skill, uh, <laughs> and uh, no, no, I mean, he, he, but he fit in well with the team, and I could tell that he, he wanted to get better, and he was really passionate about it, and he came in and did an amazing job, and is now uh, one of the, the lead engineers working on Jetpack, having his software used by millions of people every day. Um, in the course of like four years, you know, not a not a long period. Um, good job, Sam. That's that's always worked out really well. No, good job, Derek. I know. I know. <laughs> but Derek, yeah, Derek, that's Derek. if if you have people who mesh well, especially when you're a small company, it's all about like having each other's backs and going to war mm -hmm. together every day. Cool. Um, so you you have to be. 100% on the same team, uh, same page. Yeah? When it came to that point where you knew you could scale and you um, knew that it was time to scale, uh, are there any principles that kind of guided you through that? Because that seems like the really hard thing to do for all small businesses um, and, and entrepreneurs. So any uh, guiding principles for scaling? Scaling is in hiring or scaling? scaling is in <laughs> I'll let you guys handle that one. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, you know, I think that uh, we had an interesting scenario with uh, Jetpack, a product that was built for the web for free. Uh, it was something that we gave back to the community uh, for five years before we put any kind of plans or, or, or revenue behind it. Um, and now we've got uh, a pricing model and a a plan system and everything in, in place, um, but we're still kind of struggling with that because um, it's built on the foundation of something that was never really meant to uh, to grow in that way. Um, but you know, I think that what really happens for us, one of the things that I could just give you as a tip was just internally for us, we had an entire uh, division dedicated towards giving something away for free, and we had to change the entire mindset of that entire corporate structure, right? Um, so when it came time to scale and, and to, to kind of grow out of that mindset, um, it just took a lot of very determined people kind of like churning away every single day and, and setting uh, the standards, the new standard for the company uh, from a leadership perspective. Uh, so I, I would kind of say that translates to whatever it is that you're working on. I'll let these guys answer a, a deeper level, uh, more granular. Uh, <laughs> 
you, when you scale your workflow and your processes change. They have to. Um, and so for me, uh, it's been invest in that, you know, um, you know, because I, so I guess, you know, it really depends on, on your goals, right? Um, so for me, um, I'm crazy. Like, I, I just want to ride this thing as, I, I want to take it as far as I can. Um, and, you know, there are lots of people, and this is not to, you know, no disrespect at all. You're probably much saner and mentally healthier than I am. If you want to just build like a little boutique operation, that's, that's super cool. It's never really been my thing. Um, and so I've, I've felt like I've, every time that I've pushed to invest in the long term, in the long play, like, okay, maybe we're not going to have as many billable hours this month, but we're going to, you know, upend our process and make this thing more efficient. Um, it's paid off eventually. And so if, I think that's just a great driving principle to have always, but especially in that, because you can have old processes that work for you at a certain scale and are nonsense when you try and scale, and then the pain of negotiating that on the fly is not worth it. So find your, your magic, like your superpower, and the thing that you enjoy, and delegate and empower everything else. Like... So I had a bunch of uh, hats. One of my first did I think was okay. I got to do this support hat, this hat. I go, I don't want this hat. I don't want that. And so I was like, first chance I could. Here's the hat. Take it. See you later. But I would say, generally speaking, scale wise or whatever the magic formula is, find the thing that like drives you, and that you're really good at, and then get, and I'm good at like two things, and everything else, I find the best. I can or develop them to take all that stuff. That, that That's their magic. You know what I'm saying? And that's the power of a team too, by the way. Like when everybody's jiving, doing their, like the thing that drives them, that s sings in their heart, man, that's where the cool stuff happens. Yeah, but the common the common theme with those, all these answers is that you need someone in a in a leadership role, mm -hmm. right, to guide those individuals through that, that flow, whether it's chaos and craziness or you're just scaling and, and, and building stuff. You need someone with the vision, uh, and, and defining a vision, especially in, at those times when you're starting to really start to scale and move up, is something that everyone in the company should be leaning against. Uh, because then you know exactly whether or not you're, you're, you're moving in the right direction. And it's easier to take risks because you know that that risk is defined in a way to uh, you know, promote or sustain that vision. That's great advice. Thank you. To that, there was something that uh, Corey said earlier about uh, having a set of shared values as a company and a, a, an overall mission. And by having that uh, explicitly defined, then you tell people, you know, as long as you're operating within that spirit and within those values and towards that goal, you're doing the right thing. So you, if you can communicate that higher level vision and then allow people, you know, use that as a framework. Uh, I, I really like that. Yeah. Stories are the best way, too, for values. Now I'm, I'm looking in, risk, in retrospect, but stories are the best ways to enforce, not enforce, share the values that actually resonate. So we had a security breach four or five years ago. <coughs> Me and my right hand are in Europe. The team back in Oklahoma City and, and spread out, you know, we're just getting the work done. I tell that story all the time. Because I want the people that didn't go all in to understand that's not what you do. Like, what we do is we go all in. And the stories help with the values, and I'm with you too, Jesse. It's like, it's leaders, you're the lid. Like, <laughs> as high as you can go or as high as the organization will go. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and Corey, in your keynote, you, know, you talked about like reading strategically being like your thought so as you guys were watching that what came up for in your mind of like what has been your kind of secret weapon as you grow the business or transition just back into whatever it is and what are those things for for you guys that have kind of did that hmm. um i talked a little bit about risk before that's been kind of like the thing that i keep going back to for me and the success that i've seen and the work that i've been doing is that 
there's a few things that I've worked on over the last few years that um, if I had just defined them and let people tell me how bad of an idea it was, uh, they would never have come into fruition. And a lot of those things are actually make up a decent amount of the revenue that we're seeing uh, for our company now. Um, so for me, it was a risk because it was my job, uh, because I'm going against a good amount of people. Uh, but it was also a risk because even if everybody agreed that it's a good idea, it's still a risk. You don't know if it's going to work. Um, so something like that, uh, well-defined, uh, smart risks for me has been a uh, big payoff. I'm going to give you a real boring answer. Um, I'm stubborn as hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, just um, like, okay, so when I was, so before I went to the boot camp, I thought to myself, that'd eh, be cool. Like, you know, in, in college, I'd like taken a few CS classes. In my previous job, I'd worked with programmers. Um, and, you know, um, and so my, like, my wife had her daughter, and so it was a great opportunity to kind of put a pause on my career that I wasn't really happy in any way and be a stay-at-home dad. So I, I did that for a little bit. And then I was, a couple of years later, I was like kind of itching to get back. Because uh, being productive is a really important part of my life. It always has been uh, in, in the context of work. Um, so, so I went to the boot camp and I thought, uh, you know, this will help me sort of get, like, be able to freelance and be able to stay home and work from home, which was something that was important to me with, with young kids. Um, but then I, in the boot camp, uh, we had, uh, you know, we had guest speakers come in and there was a guest speaker and he had started an agency in Albuquerque. They expanded out to Dallas and, um, they did a lot of really meaningful work for nonprofits and like at that, like, you know, that kind of put the seed, like, like you know, this, this sort of project of building this bigger thing that got me really excited. And so I think that was probably the beginning of it for me. Um, and then since then, I feel like part of it, it's always, it's just been like, I'm going to prove to myself that I can do this enormous thing. Um, and then I'm going to take it as far as I can take it. It's sort of an exercise in like self-discipline and, you know, um, belief, um, which does not come natural to me. Um, I like... Like so Corey's talking about reading, I, I like reading, but I don't love reading like business books. I like reading like, you know, Gatsby and I don't know <laughs> stuff like that, right? Um, and uh, and also, um, you know, you know, none of that stuff comes all that natural to me. These like long term sort of things. So, so this is almost just a challenge myself, um, and I've I've also been damn lucky. So, so that combination <laughs> of stubbornness, meeting the right people, a little bit of luck. Um, you make your I, own luck. Yeah. Sometimes you, you meet people. Sometimes yeah. you meet, that's another thing. I, I, I didn't do it by myself. I had yeah. partners. I always had partners. Man, moral support of partners is just so amazing. Um, and, and for me, just vital. You know. Uh, so we are now into break time. If uh, We got started a few minutes late, so... Um, if you guys want to take a couple more questions, I'm I'm good with that. But if you uh, if you want to go get a snack, uh, go for that. Actually, I'm not sure that there are snacks. But <laughs> <laughs> I think there may be the leftover cookies. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thank you.